thank you for coming here this afternoon. The lecture is uh, called The Language of Glass, so if you're in the wrong room, you can leave now and no problem. But uh, otherwise, we'll spend the next hour uh, speaking with the two artists that I deeply admire, John Toriano right here in the middle, and James Drake on the end. The idea of this uh, talk is that, um, uh, well, first of all, that we're in Santa Fe, and this is a, a, an area, a territory where uh, the arts, and especially um, handmade materials such as ceramics and, and clay and, uh, uh, and uh, wood, uh, fabric, are all really indigenous to the culture here. And glass is a material, as, an, as a creative expressive material, is relatively new to the region, though it's increasingly popular in the area among artists, among collectors. And um, as works are acquired, uh, and now I'm speaking, I guess, to the collectors, and, and collectors are developing a, a greater understanding or sensibility about uh, the creative possibilities of glass and their aesthetic qualities, and as more artists get involved in working with glass, um, uh, we wanted to discuss it as a medium and, and speak with uh, James and John, who are two artists that have Santa Fe connections, but also interna international reputations, and who are articulate proponents for the function of glass in their own work and in its place in contemporary art. Uh, by way of introduction, I want to say briefly that, um, and the way this will proceed is I'll introduce them, we'll go through a little slideshow, I'll interview them on some questions, <coughs> and then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. James is uh, an internationally acclaimed artist. He's been honored by inclusion in the Venice Biennale and the Whitney Biennial. And he's explored a lot of themes in his work through various materials in sculpture, video, installation, photography, drawing, and glass. And uh, James was at the Pilchuck Glass School in 1990 for the first time with renowned glass artist Lino Talapietra. And uh, I told a joke about this this morning. I said, if you were a beginning photographer and you wanted to learn photography, Having Lino Calapietra help you make glass is kind of like having Ansel Adams help you make prints. You know? So James got the best right from the start. And I think helped you make this piece right up here on the, uh, on the slide. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah. OK. And then also, uh, we have John Torriano, who uh, has exhibited works in museums and galleries nationally and internationally, and has received many awards, and uh, is currently a professor of studio art at New York University and has worked in glass as an artist in residence at Pilchuck and I think other places as well. Is that true or only at Pilchuck? Uh, for glass, just at Pilchuck. Uh, just at glass, Pilchuck. And that's uh, over several experiences beginning in the uh, early 80s. So I wanted to begin, and I guess we could bring down the house lights now, by going through a, a brief slideshow to orient you towards Pilchuck. Uh, this will be Thank you for having me. This will be lots of fun, I hope. And um, I've got just a few slides. And I have to say that uh, when I was invited to, to Pilchuck, and I believe uh, probably through John and uh, Dale Chamuli, uh, they said, why don't you come out and be an artist in residence and uh, let's see what uh, happens. I had never, ever done anything in class. I had no knowledge of class. I had no uh, knowledge of even a glass artist or what it meant, nothing, zero. So when I got there, it was uh, actually pretty exciting. I, I had a lot of fun. Uh, they had a little skinny dipping pool there, and that was uh, uh, one of the big attractions. So that was kind of, I think everybody there was uh, enthralled by that. And uh, they gave me a studio. I guess they give everybody a studio. And uh, what I wanted to do was make glass knives. And I thought about glass, and like I said, I knew that glass to me was in windows and something you drink water out of, or, uh, or, or something else like that. Maybe stained glass windows, if you thought of it in a, uh, in a context of uh, you know, the churches in, uh, in Europe. So I was doing a lot of work with uh, uh, things on the border, so I thought, the border and glass. Now, how, what can I do to, to sort of marry those two or, or marry the Mexican culture and the Aztec culture and the Mayan culture? And I thought, well, you know, uh, the Aztecs had obsidian swords, which were uh, incredibly lethal. 
and I can never pronounce the name of it. It's M A C Q U A H U I L T M A Q U I H U I L T, something like that. Anyway, you've probably seen those uh, if you've ever gone to Mexico City and the, all the obsidian blades. Well, now. Um, and, and when I say now, I don't mean right now, but in the last, let's say, 20 or 30 years, and maybe there's a surgeon in the, uh, in the audience, a lot of uh, surgeon, uh, surgeons, especially uh, uh, plastic surgeons, use obsidian blades and uh, scalpels for, uh, uh, because it gives a much cleaner cut. It, they're a hundred times sharper than a steel blade, which I, a stained steel blade, which I find very fascinating. And uh, so when they're operating and so forth, they get a much cleaner cut, the healing process is quicker and so forth. So I thought, I'm going to make glass knives. <laughs> so this is <laughs> that long and did, uh, actually I guess he wanted to do this stuff. I think it would probably, as John said earlier we were talking, it was probably fun for him to do something a little different. And. Uh, also, some of the other pieces that I did, Dante did, uh, did those as well. And of course, I didn't realize I was working with two giants in the glass thing. Uh, but uh, anyway, so I made these glass knives. These are steel and glass. This is called uh, the green axe. And this one's a little different from the obsidian uh, pieces because everybody's probably familiar with Rene uh, Magritte's uh, famous bronze sculpture. The uh, 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 labors of Alexander where the, the stump, the tree stump is, has been chopped down but the root is growing over the axe. So I thought well, I'll do a, an axe and I'll make this as a, as a homage to uh, Rene Magritte and that's why I wanted to do it in the green, sort of had this forest feel to it. These are some more glass knives, just like a surgeon would believe me now. <laughs> <coughs> What? I said, that looks great, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> this was the, you know, and uh, uh, I call this one Valley of the World, and there's some, and actually I made three of these, and I thought again, okay, I'm going to do something everybody's familiar with, and that's a glass vase. What could be more traditional? What could be more, uh, I think in glass, uh, you have to push either, either one or two things. You have to take it as far as you can into the beauty, into the luxuriousness, the luminosity, or you have to make it the ugliest that it can possibly be. <laughs> uh, now, making it ugly is real difficult. <laughs> it has been done. But I was trying. <laughs> so I filled some of these. This one is filled with water. And I would fill some of them with different uh, fluids. Uh, uh, like um, uh, antifreeze and all kinds of different things uh, to get the color. And uh, Lino, again, he did all these. And what I would do is I would make, and I do lots of drawing. So uh, I would just make these drawings of vases and knives and all that kind of stuff. And then I'd just bring them in and tack them up on the wall and go, hey guys, okay, here you go. And so they would, uh, they would make it. Okay. And that, that's it. I was an artist in resident at Ohio State University in 1975, and an artist named Bruce Chow, who later became the uh, uh, area head of glass at uh, Rhode Island School of Design after Dale Chihuly, was putting together a glass shop there. And he approached me to do something in glass because typically I was using glass uh, <coughs> pieces in my paintings and my sculptures glass gems, uh, and uh, I said, John, you got these glass gems, come on down, you've got to do something in glass, and I didn't, I didn't know who he was or anything, so I went down there and did a kind of Neanderthal painting, instead of putting, my idea was instead of putting a, a glass gems on a, in a painting, I would make the painting out of glass and then put the paint in the, in the glass, like the reverse. And I just liked it. It was fun. It took me out of myself a little bit. And he said, you've got to meet, you, you know, you, you'd hit it off with my friend Dale Chihuly. You've got to meet him. And, he, and I said, who is he? And he teaches at Rhode Island School of Design. And I said, well, I go there all the time. I teach there on a regular basis. So uh, that was the start of my, my, uh, my uh, you could say, affair with glass. I'm, I'm still married to um, 
painting and sculpture, but every now and then I sneak off and have a, a, an affair, trying to keep them apart. But anyway, um, uh, uh, Dale and I hit it off right, right off the bat as friends, and uh, we've been friends ever since. And when he, uh, you know, he wanted me to come out to Pilchuck, and I've been to Pilchuck several times uh, over the, the 80s and 90s, and uh, it took me a few times to in internalize how I would uh, deal with glass. As you can see, I, uh, I, ha I made the world's largest diamond. It's 360 million carats. <laughs> it represents the love you have to give. <laughs> a lousy quarter carat isn't going to do it. <laughs> Anyway, I had been making these, what I call oxy gems, out of plywood, and they, uh, uh, they're oxy gems because they're like, you know, wooden diamonds, you know, an oxymoron is the idea. And so my idea when I first went to Pilchuck was, well, would it be great to make a vase uh, in the shape of one of these? And so uh, Flora and Joey were my first team. Uh, and we made a, a crude, um, uh, a crude uh, plaster mold, and, and, and Billy Morris was my first uh, gaffer. By the way, I've had all the best gaffers making these. <laughs> you can you name the, the best gaffers. It turned out the Museum of Modern Art had this gift for flowers for their, uh, uh, you know, entryway, and they decided to have artists who made um, vessels. Uh, featured for the distribution and so the one and only time I've been exhibited in the Museum of Modern Art has been with glass. Interestingly enough. So uh, I, I liked the idea at the time that they would be thought of as both art and vases uh, because I like to cross boundaries uh, between ideas so that you're suspended between is it art, is it a vase, what is it? I like that being in that. After that, I formalized my relationship to glass and I had a, a series of molds made out of quarter inch steel, two piece molds. <clears throat> and uh, the next time I went, I made the, this series where in, I, in, in the glass shop they call these little pieces of glass that they like to roll onto the bubble jimmies. Uh, uh, like when you go to the ice cream store, you know, and they dip them in Jimmy's. And then I had my version called Jimmy's, but I had my version called Johnny's, which were bigger. And uh, that creates all those different uh, splooches of... These are rhombi and uh, polyhedral shapes that were originally made out of wood and that you saw earlier. Are they solid glass? No, no, uh, these are uh, uh, blown into a mold, and only uh, only a really good gaffer can do them. Uh, uh, Billy did them, Rich Royal did them, I think Dante Marioni did some, and uh, uh, James Mongrain has, has uh, done quite a few. You did get the best. Did yeah. And it's not easy because it's But like, Lino didn't work for you. Though. No. Okay. James has still got that. <laughs> Lino, Lino, Lino would not, uh, I, I, don't, I doubt he could do it. <laughs> took an American, That's not you know, to be like, let out of this room. <laughs> no, not it just it's like forty-five pounds of uh, yeah. glass on this. Brings up what I was referring to earlier. I had a friend, Mel Florikawa, and another friend, uh, Richard Silvarnas. Richard Silvarnas is a cinematographer who works for Hal Hartley. Uh, I don't know if you know his films, but he also did, was his own films. He's a great photographer, and Mel is a, an Ikebana artist that earns his living doing um, um, installations of flowers for restaurants and things. And we, I call this a collaboration. We did these photos to be produced in a magazine or in a book with some writing. Never got to that point. But we did have an exhibition, uh, Mel and I, uh, that was something like this. And what I liked about this was, it, you liked it when you went in. It was beautiful. But how do you possess it? You know, you, 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 what do you buy? You don't buy it. You can, you know, you'd have to hire it. And so it puts you in that place where you don't have to feel responsible as a viewer for what you're looking at. 
by uh, a, a takeoff um, on the influence that Glass has had on me was this commission. Uh, if you go to the Las Vegas airport, on the when you um, leave the airport, I think you see these. It's either leaving or entering. I think it's leaving, and it's a series of uh, gem shapes, which I later did in a smaller version of uh, stained glass. These are the most recent ones. But you can see this one at Kate Elliott's booth up there. And there's one of these. This is uh, an example of the mold, oh. what the molds look like. Yeah, yeah. And we have a team. That's Rich Royal. Oh, yeah. And I, I did things like open up the Corey holds doors <laughs> and also clamp the mold shut and you know, it's, you know it's, it's a certain timing. It's very athletic in a way and, and the gaffer knows when it has to go in and when it has to come out. Okay, that's the end of that. <laughs> okay, I guess we'll bring the lights up. Thank you. And, uh,